Hi, uh, I am utterly uh, delighted to welcome uh, David Bengro and David Graeber um, as the keynote speakers of our PPA Plus. <laughs> yes, I, I did say that. Yes, uh, as our keynote speakers, I don't think either of these speakers uh, need much of an introduction, especially to this um, audience, but not to many audiences. I don't think so. I'm not going to take up any more time or um, uh, space, really. The title of the lecture is The Myth of the Stupid Savage. And now, um, up to you. And I, I'll, I'll keep hold of this for later. So we'll do three quarters of an hour of talk, and then the same again for questions or something like that. Right, floor is yours. Is that, yeah, that's definitely working. Oh, no. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> Who's starting? Um, you'll do the first two sentences, and then I'll, I'll pick up. Okay. <laughs> we, we don't want to uh, lecture at you. And, as you can um, see, yeah. As, we have prepared uh, nothing, except everything. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. uh, so I, I'm an archaeologist, and I, I, I just want to thank uh, the organizers of this for inviting uh, an archaeologist to talk about these um, uh, kinds of uh, quite fundamental uh, issues uh, about uh, politics. Um, and uh, I'm not going to bore you, as archaeologists often like to do, with pictures of 30,000-year-old uh, royal-looking burials or magnificent stone temples from before the Neolithic period. Much um, though they are cool. Yeah, um, but we'd rather try and attempt something like a, a dialogue because in a way uh, that is what we propose to talk about is the importance of dialogue um, in human history. Yeah, well, okay. Um, and, and we chose to call our paper about the myth of the stupid savage because, well, this came out of our work on Rousseau. We were originally going to write a book on the origins of social inequality and um, the more we started researching the topic, the more we realized that this is kind of a weird question to even be asking. First of all, it assumes a sort of primordial state of innocence or, and that inequality you know, sort of comes out of that. Um, and the, the reason why we, we, we started is because we realized that essentially for the last two, three hundred years. People have just been giving variations on the same narrative of, as Rousseau uh, over and over and over again. And it never seems to go away. So we wanted to create an alternative narrative. But finally, yes, why was he asking this question to begin with? The interesting thing about Rousseau was that he, he was actually writing the famous essay on the origin of social inequality for a contest for the best essay on uh, the uh, origins of social inequality. It was put out by the Academy Dijon in, I believe, 1751 or up uh, to. It must be slightly earlier, because the discourse is 1754, so... The contest was the year before, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so something 1753, like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, he, but basically, basically, the joke was he didn't win. Um, and there was, I actually managed to get a hold of uh, all the other essays that were submitted. There's one book where you can find out. Um, and it was hotly contested, hotly contested. Many of the arguments that you see nowadays were already being bounced around in 1751. And, and the thing which fascinated me when I started reading this is, okay, Ancien Regime France. Here we have a society where presumably, you know, no one had ever walked into a room where they didn't know exactly where everybody ranked in relation to each other. It's one of the most hierarchical and elaborately hierarchical societies that you know, one could imagine. Why did they think that social inequality had an origin at all? That you know, it, it doesn't go back to the Bible in the Middle Ages. You know, everybody assumed there's Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve. You know, at the very beginning, there's hierarchy. Um, and so, but on the other hand, you know, here they have, they're doing essay contests, which just assume that everybody starts from the question of, of there was primordial equality and, and something changed, what was it? So, so we started a process of asking how that came about. And um, what we discovered was, I don't want to cut completely to the end, but um, we discovered is that what Rousseau really changed, introduced, was not the idea of the noble savage, um, which is kind of a 
dubious concept at all. It was really introduced by very conservative, explicitly racist thinkers, actually, in the 19th century as a way of um, for making fun of, of the sort of people who we now had attitudes which were typical of, of cultural anthropologists, which were somewhat relativistic. Um, and, um, or, or said that cult non-Western cultures really had any value at all. Um, it wasn't the idea of the noble savage, or the, you know, there, there are people out there who have something to teach us. That was very much assumed um, in the discourse he came out of. But the idea that they had something to teach us because of what they didn't know, that they were somehow innocent creatures who um, Rousseau even argued that, that um, people in a state of nature have no imagination. They have no sense of history. They can't project themselves into the future. Their happiness is based on their, this com their complete simple-mindedness. And that was actually a new idea. Um, that wasn't in the previous discourse, as we'll see. So, and, and that, in turn, um, made me reflect on the very idea of political self-consciousness. And, mm. and I thought I would start by talking a little bit about that. Um, we are we have a notion that somehow what makes humans humans is the fact that we are self-conscious, that we can fully conscious beings that can reflect on the nature of our reality and our situation, and that that has both a individual and a social manifestation. So you know, if you go back to Cartesian dualism, thought, self-reflection is the definition of what makes us uh, uh, sentient beings different from animals. Um, and, and that notion of, of self-consciousness is simultaneously reflected on the note in the idea that society itself can and should at least ultimately become self-conscious. Um, the ideal of social evolution was seen as getting us to a point of self-consciousness, whether in the philosophical sense in Hegel, where all history leads up to the point where you can have someone like Hegel reflecting on the nature of history. Um, or the idea that, that um, you know, self-consciousness is embodied in actual control over the conditions of your existence, and um, Marx and other socialist thinkers. So, so, so it's actually a very interesting notion because you have people, for example, arguing that um, you know, ancient Greeks and Homer weren't actually conscious at all. You know, the, the bicameral mind guy in this argument. Um, there, there are people. And so the, somehow our consciousness or self-consciousness advances over time. But even, which is actually quite odd, um, if you be the idea that human beings are self-conscious and that's the definition or, or that we are more so. Uh, neuroscientists actually say that self-consciousness tends to last about seven seconds in human beings, a sort of window of consciousness when you're consciously reflecting on, uh, you're aware that you exist. Basically, we're on autopilot almost all the time and might as well be asleep. Uh, that's why you know, people can do these kind of forms of elaborate sleepwalking where they get into cars and drive off you know, 200 miles and suddenly say, where am I? Because you might as well be asleep when you're doing most of that stuff anyway. But there's an exception to that. Ah. Yes, indeed. There is an exception to that, which is um, largely when you're talking to someone else. Um, so in conversation and in, in, in dialogue, um, you actually can maintain consciousness for very long periods of time, uh, which is why you need to imagine you're talking to someone else to really be able to think out a problem. So actually, consciousness is a social phenomenon. It's dialogic. Um, so, so rather than, you know, self-consciousness being this incredible achievement that we eventually have. Most ancient philosophers, for example, assume that. You know, they start with dialogues. Almost all ancient philosophy, whether it's in China, India, um, or Europe, takes the form of conversations. But there are conversations about thinking about how you can become a self-conscious individual, which is the kind of person Descartes sort of assumes that we start us, even though we're not. Um, However, so, so social consciousness in you know, most of the world's history has assumed your starting point, an individual consciousness, something, something you maybe will someday achieve. Instead, we flip that over, and nowadays we seem to have this idea that the very idea that we can imagine and create a society is something new. Um, that it's something that you know, takes huge amounts of historical evolution to get to. Mm. And... Um, and that's, yeah. in a way, I think, uh, one of the... I mean, we should probably say we, we came at these kind of uh, rather general issues 
through some very specific parts of evidence, because uh, mm. as David was uh, pointing out, we initially set out about, what, six or seven years ago to contribute to this uh, burgeoning literature uh, on the topic of inequality and the origins of inequality, and it was in the process of actually thinking about what kind of contribution we would make as an archaeologist and an anthropologist that we just began to realize how peculiar the starting point of the question really is insofar as it assumes that there was something else in order for a social inequality to have an origin. So in looking back at the origins of the question, what we found were uh, a number of interesting things that we would want to talk about today. Um, but it might be helpful to follow, or maybe for me to follow, some of those sort of trains of thought uh, initially, um, which really are about this issue of what you might call self-conscious political behavior. What would most of human history look like uh, if we wrote it from the starting assumption that people have always had and exhibited that kind of self-conscious uh, awareness of their own political arrangements? Now, there's a sort of paradox here, because if you read evolutionary biologists and evolutionary theorists like uh, Christopher Berm, whose book uh, Hierarchy in the Forest, uh, he's a primatologist, um, is quite explicit about this and says, well, this is precisely what makes human politics different from the politics of, say, chimpanzees or bonobos or orangutans, uh, is what he calls our actuarial intelligence, which I, I believe what he means by this is the fact that we can, in fact, imagine what another kind of society might be like. So imagine a group of hunters and gatherers um, who can picture what might, in fact, transpire if they didn't make fun uh, of the very skilled hunter uh, who brought down the uh, ideal catch that day, or if they didn't share out the meat uh, and other uh, resources from the hunt uh, in an equal sort of way without prejudice uh, towards those who actually engaged in it. Uh, they can sort of imagine what kind of society they might be living in uh, if they didn't make fun of exceptionally talented uh, individuals. Uh, and therefore they build uh, uh, their own society on the basis partly of imagination. But there is a paradox here, and the paradox is that when he and other writers actually talk about what happened in human history, uh, it's almost as if they don't want to explore the implications of their own hypothesis. Uh, because what, uh, what he writes quite explicitly is that for most of human history, at least in political terms, nothing really happened. People lived in these small egalitarian bands of foragers, hunters, foresters, and gatherers for 100,000 plus years. Then there was the origins of agriculture, and then came the six, seven, or eight, however many uh, great civilizations with their alpha male uh, pharaohs and kings and leaders. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as we all know, this is effectively uh, uh, the story in outline that Rousseau was telling 250 or so years ago. Now, to me as an archaeologist, this is very interesting. Would it not be very bizarre uh, and fascinating if all the efforts of me uh, and all my archaeological colleagues to actually dig down into the traces of what humans have got up to just happened to conform perfectly to what some Swiss philosopher imagined might have been the case uh, in 1754. Wouldn't that be an extraordinary coincidence? Uh, and in fact, uh, that is roughly uh, the sort of consensus. When you read uh, sort of big history type books, it's very much the impression you get. Um, it's yeah. also, we're quite convinced, uh, wrong. Uh, to say this in almost every uh, respect. And a lot of what we've been doing for the last few years is quite sort of detailed empirical work, uh, actually looking at what the evidence tells us now and other ways to conceptualize right. it. Because it's very easy to say it's all wrong. You can do that in about 20 pages. But if you want to say what actually happened, mm. it's an enormous amount of work because Essentially, it's not just that people don't write for people outside their specialties, they don't write for people outside their subspecialties. That's right. An enormous work of synthesis that just nobody's been doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the reactions to that have, have been 
quite instructive because we it's quite hard to find an archaeologist, I think, or, or even harder to find a, a social anthropologist these days who openly says, yes, I am a social evolutionist. <laughs> I believe that human societies mm. evolve and go through these stages uh, from yeah. simple to complex. Yeah, and if, I mean, if, you, if you study anthropology, you do an intro anthropology course, you know, you get rid of the evolutionists in the first lecture. Well, you know, then there, first there's the guys who are really dumb, but, mm -hmm. you know, nobody takes that seriously anymore. And then he critiqued the structural functionalists as a sort of more worthy idiot opponents. Um, but, you know, in fact. Yeah, and we take it at face value. When people tell us they're not evolutionists, uh, we, we assume that they're not. Um, however, uh, every time we seem to propose an interpretation of some body of archaeological uh, evidence or anthropological evidence that goes against the assumptions of a kind of linear notion of social evolution, uh, we seem to get into all sorts of trouble. People uh, freak out. Yeah. yeah, not with the evidence. Uh, I mean, the evidence in some ways, uh, I mean, maybe it's worth giving a few small sort of uh, examples or case studies of, of what we've been up to, what we've sort of published. Shall we talk so about the Paleolithic uh, burials? So, for example, uh, it's uh, very striking. Yeah. Thank you, yes. If you go back to <laughs> the earliest um, evidence, mm -hmm. the earliest sort of concrete evidence we have for how human societies are organized, uh, you can't really say very much about, let's say, the first uh, 200,000 years, because all we've got are these great expanses of time in which there might just be, you know, various small scatters of flint tools and the odd tooth or skull remnant or something. But if we go back to, let's say, uh, roughly the time of the last ice age or the last glacial maximum, sort of 200, uh, excuse me, 20,000, 30,000 uh, years ago, uh, particularly in Europe, simply because uh, Europeans have been practicing archaeology for a very long time with a lot of resources, there is actually enough evidence to say something in outline uh, about what human societies were like. Uh, and what we find in those cases is really nothing like these rather boring sort of abstractions that you get from evolutionary theory, which tell us we ought to be expecting small-scale, vaguely egalitarian societies. Uh, actually, what you see concretely in the archaeological evidence uh, are things like these extraordinary uh, burials, which in any other context one would interpret as princely or regal. I mean, individuals uh, buried with huge amounts of personal wealth, ornamentation, regalia, and so on and so forth. Uh, we see architectural uh, constructions that are clearly different from everyday uh, dwellings, implying some sort of uh, public uh, building. Um, and um, it's very peculiar uh, because what we don't find uh, alongside these things are any of the usual trappings of a very hierarchical, uh, organized, uh, sort of stratified society. We don't find fortifications. We don't find... Uh, storage. Yeah, yeah, lots of evidence for administration or centralized storage. It's almost as if you have these sort of, uh, almost sort of ritualistic pageants of what it might be like to have a king or a queen uh, or something like that. And then it comes into the archaeological record and then it sort of fades out again. So we started looking into the literature of what people actually make of this evidence, um, which is kind of intriguing. Uh, I think it's actually Berm who, who puts it very nicely when he says we seem to be trapped in this endless kind of to and fro between Hobbes on the one hand and Rousseau uh, on the other. So on the one hand, there are the sort of neo-Rousseau type uh, commentators who basically just ignore all this evidence. This evidence is basically inconsequential. We're just going to write as if people <laughs> were living in small egalitarian societies for most of human history. That's one sort of view. Uh, then there's the sort of Hobbesian view, which goes quite the other way and says, well, there must have been ranked, stratified mm. aristocracies all the way back to the Ice Age. Actually, someone just drew to my attention there's mm. going to be a big meeting of specialists in uh, Paleolithic archaeology uh, in France, uh, which is sort of the uh, spiritual heartland of all this kind of research, uh, called something like Aristocracies in the Stone Age, uh, just in a few months' time, right. uh, in the Dordogne. Um, and um, 
We don't really find either of these accounts terribly right. plausible. Yes, I mean, for one thing, there is the fact that the vast majority of the skeletons that seem to get the regal treatment are giants or hunchbacks or dwarfs or otherwise physically deformed in some way, which seems to make it rather unlikely that the, you know, we're dealing with some Aris De strange deformed aristocracy. Right, <laughs> and also, you know, presumably, if they were princes, uh, there's one famous example from uh, Liguria, which archaeologists, you know, archaeologists love to give names to things. Uh, so they call this particular burial Il, Il Principe. Uh, now, if if he really was a prince in the Machiavellian sense, then presumably he would have got people to do more on his behalf than just make very elaborate headdresses out of small shells. Uh, he would have had them, you know, form yeah. little armies or... Uh, and it reminds one very much of Hookhart, who, uh, who had the argument oh, yes. that, you know, kings come from rituals, that people were putting on these theatrical rituals, sort of performing um, royalty before they actually even had it. And in fact, that a ritual is a sort of zone of experiment where they played around with different social possibilities. And it sounded really wacky when he proposed in the 1920s. But, you know, the archaeological evidence that we've got now, that's a much more plausible interpretation than the conventional evolutionist view everybody seems to feel they have to buy. It might not be right, but it's a lot closer to the evidence. Actually. So what we found ourselves doing, and I think, you know, this is one of the advantages of talking to each other from our different uh, sort of uh, training, um, is thinking about uh, seasonality, because there's a great literature in anthropology uh, about uh, the way that hunter-gatherer societies and many other societies uh, actually flip and alternate between very different kinds of political arrangements, uh, depending uh, partly on the time of year. Uh, so one will have periods of great economic abundance, let's say when the bison uh, or the deer or the woolly mammoth, if we're in Pleistocene Europe, are coming through the valleys, um, and you'll have extremely elaborate uh, social measures put in place to make sure uh, that the hunting is successfully completed. And during those periods, you might have a very authoritarian kind of political organization. But once it's all over, Mm -hmm. Society changes shape. Uh, Marcel Mauss actually used the term social morphology, I think, to describe this. Mm -hmm. Society moves and transforms from these very large, dense aggregations, often into precisely the kind of little, small, scattered bands that people often imagine we lived mm -hmm. in for most of human history. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't really take a genius mm -hmm. to see that Ice Age Europe is bound obviously, mm -hmm. to have produced these kind of seasonal variations. We're talking about a very different kind of Europe uh, in terms of climate and environment, fauna and flora, to anything we see around us today. I mean, it was more like Serengeti Park with forests all along the Mediterranean coast and then this great zone of tundra uh, leading up into the ice sheets and then these little sort of uh, what geographers call refugia, or refugia, uh, where humans and animals and plants can actually uh, keep themselves going for long periods of time. Um, so putting these two things together, drawing on decades mm. of careful research by prehistorians, uh, we started developing the notion that actually what one is seeing with these very elaborate burials and expressions of hierarchy uh, are exactly that kind of uh, fluidity or flexibility. Now. Then we turned to the ethnographic literature, which allows you to see what it actually might mean in something more like psychological and philosophical terms mm -hmm. to actually flip your society round between two quite radically different social structures, uh, which brings us back oh. to the core sort of issue about consciousness. Right? right, right, because the irony is that rather than living in this sort of naive state of not having figured out complex social arrangements yet, um, you know, people living in these societies with what most called a dual social morphology with season, extreme seasonal variations are actually way more self-conscious about social possibilities than probably anybody living today because you know, they completely shifted social structures every year um, to the extent that in some societies people actually had different names at different times of year. You know, you'd have one summer name and one winter name. A lot of the Northwest Coast societies were like that. Um, you'd belong in different you know, sort of ritual associations. You'd have different settle, um, settlement 
tight households, kinship, everything changed. Um, and it could change in any number of different ways. It wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, in one season you might have an authoritarian, you know, you all get together and create a little king or some authoritarian structure, and then you disperse in your egalitarian bands. Um, the famous example by Marcel Most, seasonal variations of, of the Eskimo, it came out in 1902, um, you know, they pointed out that they actually had authoritarian bands. You know, they had little patriarchal units during the summer, and they got together in the summer and they like had common property and had giant wife swapping orgies and you know had all sorts of fun. Um, but but there was you really can't predict other societies. They would have police, you know, with actual coercive powers to enforce rules arbitrarily for, but only for two months a year. Yeah. And, other, and the group who would get to do it any particular year would always rotate, so it would never be the same people two right. years in a row. Um, but then they'd, then they'd go to become, you know, scatter in bands where they resolved everything by consensus. So by the evolutionary, you know, the sort of classic band, tribe, chiefdom, state, hierarchy that archaeologists and mm. some anthropologists still apply, you know, you'd have a group that's, you know, half the year on the very bottom of the scale and half the year at the very top. You know, they were a state for two months because they had like, you know, mm. uh, uh, separated group with monopoly of the use of coercive force, you know, but other, then they went back to being like bands again. Yeah. No, I mean, again, you know, it's very hard to find anyone who will say, I believe that human societies evolve from bands to tribes to chiefdoms to states. Most anthropologists will just laugh in your face and say, oh, we, got a, we did away with all that rubbish, you know, generations ago. Yeah. Uh, and the same, by and large, goes for, for most archaeologists. But, you know, when we started publishing on this topic and presenting it and saying, well, look, it's really interesting. The, these are groups that seem to actually flip between almost a band and a state uh, on an annual basis. Uh, the kind of reactions we, we got were really, well, you know, you're, you're getting this all wrong. You're blowing this out of proportion. It doesn't really affect the large story of human history. Those uh, aren't really monumental architecture, they're just big huts. Well, yeah. maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. we could just call them mm -hmm. complex hunter-gatherers, <laughs> so that one still retains the possibility of talking about a simple to complex trajectory uh, until you start farming. And mm -hmm. you know, another example of the same sort of thing, we, uh, we got very interested in the ethnography of the west coast of North America, um, where you have these uh, very uh, extensive distributions of non-farming populations, hunters, gatherers, fishers, and so on, going all the way down from the, the northwest coast of what's now uh, British Columbia. From Alaska. Uh, yeah. Right, or Alaska, right the way down to California. And reading our way into this literature, uh, one thing kept really striking us about this, which was the issue of slavery. Uh, now, Rousseau, uh, famously in the discourse, says slavery is an outcome of agriculture and farming. Uh, and presumably, he's got things on his mind like slave plantations and you know, the, the very close Ancient Romans. Well. Ancient Roman slavery and so on. Um, and um, this is something that uh, I think uh, you know, most people trained in our subjects are aware of, is the phenomenon of slavery among non-farming populations. And actually the classic example uh, is precisely that of the, uh, the indigenous societies of the Northwest Coast, uh, who are known to have kept slaves who were actually hereditary slaves in their households, which were organized on these highly uh, stratified, aristocratic sort of uh, lines. Mm. Um, what nobody seems to have been interested up to now uh, is why this practice of keeping slaves seems to sort of fizzle out and stop uh, as you head south into what is now, broadly speaking, uh, the area of coastal California. Um, in fact, we found this extraordinary paper from 1951, I think, by Goldschmidt, Walter Goldschmidt, which nobody's read. It's got a very strange title, something like A Contribution to Ethical and Philosophical Sociology or something, which tells you very little about its content. But it's about these Californian foragers who lived next door to the highly aristocratic slave-keeping uh, fisherman of the northwest uh, coast. And what Goldschmidt, uh, who was a student of Alfred Kerber, I believe, yeah. uh, the, the great sort of doyen of uh, Californian uh, anthropology, uh, what he argues there point for point 
is that these Californian hunter-gatherers actually had a kind of work ethic, which is remarkably similar to what Max Weber classically described as the Protestant work ethic uh, of, uh, of uh, Central and Northern Europe uh, as a kind of spiritual, ethical foundation for the rise of capitalism. But this is all going on in forager societies in California, right adjacent to these other guys uh, who seem to have a moral, ethical, political system that is precisely the opposite. Yeah, the extreme aristocratic ethos of, you know, potlucks and yeah. um, sh the massive displays and destructions of wealth, whereas the other guys are showing off how, how frugal and, 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 and yes. how they can work with sweat baths and steaming off their fat. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and basically, in, in uh, endless numbers of points there, that one society is clearly this complete inversion of the values of the other and a rejection of the values of the other. And the really yeah. striking thing was that we couldn't find, and we, we really mined down into this literature, which, I mean, all the ethnographies are online now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all out there in the public domain. We virtually couldn't find a single example of a historian or an ethnographer or an archaeologist actually saying, so how did it end up this way? Mm. How do you end up with two almost diametrically opposed political and ethical systems among hunter-gatherers living along uh, the same stretch of coastline? And the reason for this is basically that all of these groups, regardless of the really quite profound differences between them, tend to get shunted into a single category of complex hunter-gatherers. It doesn't matter what they get up to, enslaving each other, rejecting slavery, having abolitionist movements. <laughs> Somehow there's something going on that says, as soon as you see a cob of corn or a woolly sheep, all of this counts for nothing, and we reset the whole clock of social evolution back to zero. Which, again, sounds very evolutionary, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, very evolutionary. So, I mean, we got this thing published in American Anthropology. It took some doing. But it yeah. took some hard work. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, again, what seems remarkable is that uh, people weren't asking this kind of question. Right, it's just not interesting because they're on one stage and what's important to, about them is the fact that they don't farm. Right. Um, Right. So the fact that they are like completely different and very self-conscious. Again, what was interesting to us about this is it's clearly self-conscious, and it, it is. You can we even found a, a a California myth about these people from the north who came and took a bunch of slaves, and you know, and how their society fell apart because they all got fat and lazy, and eventually the slaves ran off and they had nothing. You know, they didn't know how to make food anymore. Um, it was sort of a... It's a cautionary yeah. tale. It was a cautionary tale. What tech. happens if you right. keep slaving? But it made... Yeah, it's clear it, people were thinking about this. Right. But yet somehow none of this registers. Or, you know, the idea that people are living the way they are because they actually think that's the way people ought to live and that there's different right. philosophies and values and, 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 and politics going on in societies. You know, these people are actually adults like us thinking about, you know, yeah. how, um, the nature of human society and what it should and could be like. You know, it's just considered unthinkable. Yeah, and, and you know, what we realized in doing this is that we're coming up against um, decades of research, for example, in the field of behavioral ecology, which will try and explain these kinds of differences in other ways, like, for example, the Californians historically relied a lot on gathering acorns, uh, whereas the guys to the north spent a lot of time fishing. Um, and, you know, the assumption is that somehow within the ecology, we will find a causal explanation for their social structures. Um, which is a long way from saying we're talking about people like you and me, people who can reflect on the kind of societies they live in, their neighbors live in, and build their societies and their political systems in a conscious fashion. And here's where we see the link back to Rousseau. Oh, very nice segue. Okay, let me take right? that one. Um, yes. We can indeed. do more archaeology later. Okay, we will. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, because when I started looking into the... Well, basically the origins of the question of the origin of inequality and this narrative that we are all these kind of naive creatures until some idiot goes off and invents agriculture and, and you get private property and we all know how what, what goes on from there. Um, when I looked into the origins of that, why is it that the Academy of Dijon uh, is asking this question? Uh, in 1752 or three or whatever it was, um, I, I found 
a really remarkable story, which is not much told. Um, first of all, the phrase equality and equality simply wasn't used in the Middle Ages at all. Um, you know, they've got enough stuff on database that they can do word searches now. And, you know, uh, so people have gone through and, and, and confirmed that this wasn't an issue. Nobody talked about it. The concept of, of equality and inequality really, you know, they talk about it in math. Mathematical terms so an Italian, involved, Italian PhD, I yeah. think, wasn't it? Two guys actually did a systematic they search. They just went through, the, yeah, they did a word search of all yeah. medieval literature. They said, discovered that, you know, basically until the 1500s, nobody uses these words at all. Yeah. And it really comes in with natural law theory, with discussions of what do, you, what do we make of societies in the new world, which presented a problem legally. Actually, a lot of this stuff came out of the legal problem of was it okay to conquer people who had never heard of, of, of Jesus and therefore couldn't be said to have rejected Christianity. That was the basic problem they had legally. Um, you know, it's easy if they're infidels, but like if they've never heard of Christianity at all. I mean, the, you know, the conquistadors would do this thing where they would make a declaration. Okay, you have 12 minutes to convert, and they put up, you know, in Latin. Um, but legal scholars back home were not impressed by this any more than we would be. And said, "Oh, come on, no." Um, you know, so is there a real justification to uh, to to, um, to have done this? And it was hotly debated. So that led to the question of, of you know what we now call human rights. Do people have rights that just, just by dint of existing at all, or being human at all, uh, that you could have violated by attacking them? Um, the conclusion was they did, but, but the, the question is how do you establish what those are? Um, you know, so you need to look at the simplest societies. And this is why they became fascinated with societies that they saw as egalitarian. You know, because they were seen as a sort of almost plasmatic um, stuff of which sociality comes from. You find people with, who seem to have no religion and no state and no writing and so forth and so on, what do they have? You know, what do people minimally think they owe each other in that primordial state? Then you can start getting at the sort of um, ground, basic ground rules of, of what a theory of human rights could come from. So, so talk of equality came out of that. But what really was interesting, and what really drove the conversation much more than the kind of legal theories from which it started was, you know, they started actually talking to people in the new world, and, and those conversations made a huge impact on Europe. And this is what, where there's almost a kind of a, the only way I can describe it is a kind of covert racism whereby you're always ascribing such racism to the European observers that you assume that they paid absolutely no attention to what anybody was saying to them, and therefore you have to pay no, you don't have to pay attention to what anybody was saying to them. So any, any statement or opinion attributed to a non-Western person can be written off as some noble savage trope. They didn't really say that. So you don't have to think about what they might have actually been thinking or saying. The idea that uh, people, yeah. these people were basically sub puppets. So when yeah. Montesquieu or La Montan or somebody mm -hmm. writes a dialogue with a savage, what they're actually doing is supposedly having a dialogue with themselves, uh, but avoiding going to prison, etc. by right. putting it into to the mouth of a savage so-called person they have invented. It's an incredibly right. patronizing sort right. of view. And, and it's fascinating that, that, that it's like just absolutely assumed by everyone, with the exception of scholars who are themselves Native American, um, who say, well, no, actually, a lot of these arguments are the kind of arguments people like that would have made. You know? um, and, and it's very strange that the, that whole debate is just sort of suppressed. Um, but if you look at what actually happened, um, and I took the French Enlightenment because you know that's the one that leads up to Rousseau, um, it, it, it's absolutely clear what's going on. You could reconstruct the whole thing um, because starting in the 1600s, you have these Jesuits writing reports from what's now Quebec, um, which are just you know, incredibly popular. The Jesuit relations, there's like, I don't know, 112, 100 uh, volumes of this stuff. 
like everybody bought them. I mean, middle class households would typically have these travelers reports and Jesuit ways and so forth on the shelves. They're extraordinarily popular uh, and widely debated. And, and, and one of the things which was always in there and which attracted the most attention were the critiques of indigenous people of French and European society, which almost always took the same form. And the interesting thing is that they, at first they weren't explicitly about egalitarianism at all, actually. They're mainly about freedom and mutual aid. The usual accusations were, first of all, you guys don't take care of each other. You're just mean and hyper-competitive. Um, but, but the other one was that, you know, you're a bunch of slaves. You know, you follow orders all the time. This is actually a typical quote. It gives you a sense of this. It's from 1642 uh, about the Montanese Nascapi. They imagine that they ought, by right of birth, to enjoy the liberty of wild ass colts, rendering no homage to anyone whomsoever, except when they like. They have reproached me a hundred times, because we fear our captains, while they laugh at and make sport of theirs. All the authority of their chief is in his tongue's end, for he is powerful in so far as he is eloquent, and even if he kills himself talking and haranguing, he will not be obeyed unless he pleases the savages. Um, so there's all of the, they use the word captain for pretty much anyone in a position of, of, of um, authority. But, you know, they're always going on about um, how these are the freest people on earth. And it's very interesting, when, which they didn't prove at all. Um, one of the interesting things when you read this literature is this sort of reversal, because we're taught to think of this as, this is the Western gaze. You know, the, the Europeans are kind of us, and they're observing these exotic people who you can't completely understand. But in fact, when you read it, it's the indigenous people are making pretty much all the arguments that we would be making to, to yeah. if we met a bunch of Jesuits. It's, it's the Europeans <laughs> who unquestioningly believe in the divine right of care and reveal faith, and it's Hell, actually, yeah. you know, it's, it's the indigenous folk right. who are sort of looking rationally at this. Mm -hmm. thing. Exactly. So and, and, and very often, you know, you have these indigenous people saying, well, you know, this, just logically, this makes no sense, but, so, you know, we need some distance on this. Yeah. Um, so, so, for example, in the, in the case of freedom, this is most dramatic, because nowadays you can't be against freedom, right? Um, so the usual line is that you know, personal liberty and individual freedom is obviously a value unto itself. You can't build a society entirely on that basis. There's a limit, because it wouldn't work in practice. The Jesuits you know, were exactly the opposite. They, they were like, well, you know, they have, nobody ever takes orders from anybody else. They completely refuse it. They don't use pun punishment of criminals, even. Um, and it actually works really well, and there's less crime here than there is in France, but it's terrible in principle. I mean, how are they going to learn the Ten Commandments if they don't ever command each other, you know? <laughs> you know, giving orders is necessary. It's a moral good. Uh, so, so it's exactly the opposite, you know, of, uh, of the, the opinions that most people would have today. Um, so, so, however, you know, people read these accounts, and they're very impressed. Uh, the, the interesting thing is the debate at first was entirely about liberty. And you can trace over time as indigenous people, particularly the Wendat, Huron, uh, they were called at the time, uh, Iroquoian speaking peoples, um, start, diplomats started visiting cities like Montreal, New York, actually being sent on delegations to France. A lot of them actually did go to France, so met Louis XIV, um, and, and came back to report. Uh, essentially, they started doing enough ethnography of European society that they understood what was going on. The discourse gradually shifted from freedom to a, a simultaneous emphasis, the one on freedom never went away, on, on equality. And, and I think the reason why, at first, they didn't really care about differences of property is in their own societies, there was no, really no way to turn differences of property into power over anybody else. So it never really occurred to people that that would be, you know, okay, I have some more corn, I have some more beads, that, you know, but that, why does that mean I can give anybody orders? I mean, uh, it, it just didn't make any sense within the terms of their own society. As when they figured out that, you know, European society was differently organized, they gradually shifted to um, critiques of inequality and money in particular more and more. And, and this really comes to the fore the most in the writings of a guy named Baron La Hontan, uh, who was a French, impoverished French aristocratic family. He joined the army at the age of 17. And, and, um, learned Huron and Algonquian 
And he's a great source because he was a free thinker who hated the Jesuits. So, you know, his line was like, okay, well, the Indians tell me what they really think about these guys. You know, they're two. What's up? His full name is Louis Armand de l'Homme d'Ars de La Hontan, better known as La Hontan. And he has a very strong connection to Amsterdam. Which actually. we'll get to in a moment, yeah. Um, yes. He became particular friends of a gentleman by the name of Kandirank, um, known by many names. Um, he's usually known as Kandirank in the literature, but in, you know all the. Uh, Why is it a or? Because o? o just doesn't make any sense in any, any Iroquoian language, so the, all the indigenous uh, writers put it with an a. Right? Okay. Yeah. It's just it wouldn't, couldn't possibly mean anything. Yeah. So they said it must yeah, be yeah, an A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, but, but Kondiorunk, who was basically the, the Euron ambassador who was in charge of dealing with, with the Europeans. And it turns out this guy was just utterly brilliant. He, he had been to France to meet Louis XIV himself on a diplomatic mission. And um, you know, he was constantly outsmarting the Europeans at the diplomacy. He was clear, but the thing is, he was an amazing orator. People said to him, mm -hmm. people would come from miles around just to hear, see him give a speech because even people who hated him would applaud after his speech. He was just so good. They just like it was. Um, they, everybody enjoyed listening to him talk. So eventually, there was a kind of a salon, and this is in the 1680s, right, and 90s, uh, with. Frontenac, who was the, the governor, um, would have him over for dinner and they would debate about you know, economics, politics, um, Christianity, sexual mores. And, um, and, and Lantan apparently took notes on a lot of these things. Um, later, Lantan himself um, got in trouble. He had to flee, couldn't go back to France. He ended up here in Amsterdam. For a while, he was actually homeless and working as a kind of freelance spy um, and not doing very well at all. But he saved his fortunes when he came out with a series of memoirs in 1703 and 1704, which culminated in a book of dialogues with a character he called Adario, who was one of Condirac's many names. Um, in which he you know, included all of these critiques of European society, and particularly of social inequality. Mm. Um, and I, and, and know, this became an instant bestseller. Right? It was huge. It was translated into all European languages. Everybody read it. There was a play inspired by mm. it that like ran in Paris for like twenty years. You know, it was like cats. It never went away. It was yeah. one. Um, you know, so everybody. Maybe <laughs> Les Misérables. Would be yeah. Like exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so, so this this was like enormous cultural phenomena, yeah. and um, and you know every single major Enlightenment thinker wrote an imitation of this book. Yeah. Um, and, and the funny thing is, you know, all writers assume that you know Adario is a made-up character, and even when you show like these fresh sources saying, "Oh yeah, you know, he was the smartest man who ever lived. It was amazing." You know, like like and, and would document that he engaged and did in fact engage in these kind of debates of Europeans. Somehow, we're all supposed to believe that you know the guys who witnessed this debate and thought he was the smartest person who ever lived then wrote them up and didn't use any of his actual arguments but instead like just made up other ones. This doesn't make and any this sense. process of denial, <laughs> it, 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 I was reading the other day, it begins very early. I mean, some of the Jesuits who saw La Hontan as the enemy uh, were already saying, oh, he can't really speak the languages. How can he possibly well, have debates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and this, this continues right up to the present day where you find uh, you know, these very long sort of uh, lit crypt type pieces about uh, enlightenment uh, uh, literature in literary journals about you know, the invention of a diary and the Dario as so this uh, construct of the European imagination. You, did, you see, I told you, we always get into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Ignore that. It's behind the screen. Was All right. But we should, we should okay. move, actually, we're doing time. Let me, let me move quicker. Go ahead. Okay. Um, all right. So, so everybody, every single Enlightenment thinker writes an imitation of this book. I mean, you know, Montesquieu famously is a Persian, but, but um, mostly it's, it's uh, I think, uh, Diderot has a Polynesian, Voltaire has a half Euron, um, there's Natchez, there's, uh, there, every, every sort of indigenous person you could imagine. Um, and of course, these ones are made up but they're inspired by the Jesuit literature, by the actual accounts of what people actually did say that are available. Um, and, and 
it all comes to a peak. And this is like the smoking gun. This is, I'm really found, please, I found this, by uh, a woman named Madame Givenchy. Uh, Graffini. Graffini, no, why did I call it Givenchy? Sorry, Graffini, Madame de Graffini, um, uh, who is um, one of the Salonists. Because, you know, all the Enlightenment salons have had sort of women facilitators who, of course, have been forgotten and, and marginalized in the history. But she was one of those. And um, she wrote a book, which is a Peruvian letters, uh, which was supposedly the letters home by a captured Inca princess who's trapped in France. And they're commenting on French society. And this is later remembered. It comes out in the late uh, 1740s. Um, it, it's later remembered as the first book which suggested the idea of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. You know, but she says at one point, well, why don't they just do like the Incas and take a little bit of everybody's and redistribute it? It would be a lot more rational. Which is fascinating because nowadays you constantly read people saying, well, you know, this idea of the Incas having some kind of welfare state is a projection of European categories onto mm -hmm. them. Well, actually, it might be the other way around. <laughs> Um, and she, she's in fact the best known female writer in Europe at the time, I believe. She, and she's actually considered, this book is considered something of a feminist milestone yeah. because it's the first book with a female protagonist where the female protagonist doesn't either marry or die at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. but be this as it may, um, in she has a problem. She gets ripped off for the first edition. She has to change it around a little for a second edition. She's actually going to get some money on. The book's a bestseller. It's usually popular. Um, but um, so we have these letters she sent to all her friends saying, okay, I got to change it around a little. What should I do? One of them goes to Turgot, the physiocrat, and, you know, sort of one of the great founders of modern economic theory. And this is like 1751, right before Rousseau is, is writing. Um, and we have Turgot's response. He says, well, you know, all this liberty, equality stuff, it's kind of dangerous in a way. I mean, I understand we're all for liberty and equality, but you know, I think you should have your character gradually realize over the course of the book that this is appropriate to a certain level of social development. You know, imagine, he says, you know, there's for foragers and then farmers, and then we have a complex commercial civilization like we have. You know, and these are stages. In each one, you have a more complex division of labor, and our wealth and prosperity is based on a greater division of labor, which means that we can't have as much freedom and equality as we would in a society where everyone is equally poor. So basically, he comes up with evolutionism, and, and he's the guy who then next year gives a speech on the concept of progress. He basically made it up. Um, and he comes up with the, you know, the four stages. Well, pastoralism is in there. Uh, the four stages of development, which a year later is taken up by Adam yeah. Smith, yeah. and then all it the Scots the take it up. This is the Scottish Enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is it. This is like the smoking gun, where it comes from. The very idea of social evolution based on means of livelihood. Mm -hmm. which wasn't considered all that important before this, um, based on means of livelihood, was essentially concocted as a direct response to the indigenous critique of the inequalities of European society. Mm -hmm. So it's neutralizing. Uh, it's neutralizing the, you know, the idea that these uh, people could in any way have anything valid or, or, or questioning to say about Europeans uh, because they are effectively trapped within a particular mode of subsistence. Um, no, it's not yeah. such a... Rousseau. Uh, let, me, let me do that. In the... Oh, we need to get back yeah. to Rousseau. So do one, right, uh, this yeah. Is, yeah, and, and then, then I'll pass it back. Okay. Um, because if you look at Rousseau, he's writing two years later. You know, this is what everybody's discussing in the sort of social circles he's in. So what does he do? He synthesizes. There's these two positions. There's the evolutionist position, and there's the sort of indigenous critique position. And he does both. So he comes up with the, the first fusion. Well, yes, there was this primordial state where we were truly free and equal, and that's cool. But of course, then social evolution sets in and we lose it. But you know, someday we might get there again. So basically, by synthesizing these two opposed positions, he essentially invents leftist discourse. Yeah, I mean, but he does so by you know relegating the indigenous critique to the domain of like 
these naive, innocent, stupid people who are like, you know, have insight just because they don't know anything or they, you know, they don't have the sort of social complexity which comes to ruin us. So, which of course was the classic conservative position that he invented a few years before that. In a weird way, Rousseau invented both the right and the left. Um, in two different essays for the same contest. The first one he won, the conservative one, the second one he lost. Um, <laughs> and, but, um, so this is what Rousseau did, essentially. You know, he, 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 he put the two together, and we've been stuck with this crazy synthesis of these two contradictory positions ever since. Yeah, and the, the really insidious <laughs> part about it is not the idea of the noble savage. Actually, there is no noble savage in Rousseau's discourse, uh, because his state of nature uh, involves creatures which are like humans, but actually lack any sort of philosophy at all, because what they can't do is project their own lives into the future and imagine themselves in other states. They're constantly inventing things and chasing their own tails or rushing headlong for their own chains, as he puts it. They invent agriculture, but they can't see the consequences. They invent cities, but they can't see the consequences. Um, so we're talking about... No imagination. Exactly. We're talking about <laughs> this idea of political self-consciousness sort of receding as one goes further back in time. There was a book uh, published in 1946 by the Dutch uh, archaeologist Henry Frankfurt uh, called Before Philosophy, uh, which was about the, uh, the ancient Middle East, uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt and all that sort of thing. Um, but he wasn't actually arguing that these people didn't have the capacity for philosophy. He was simply pointing out that they didn't have an explicit written tradition of speculative thought like that of the ancient Greeks. So they, when they did speculate, they did it in other ways, through images, through discourse on the non-human world, etc., etc. To find the idea that there have actually ever been individuals uh, who didn't possess any capacity for philosophical reflection, one has to go to Rousseau. But of course, Rousseau is very explicit in saying that this isn't supposed to be history. Oh yeah. I don't actually believe any of this really happened. I mean, he says it very clearly. It's in the right discourse. there. Yeah. Just do not take this as a basis for your reconstruction of what actually happened in the past. This is a thought experiment. And what seems so extraordinary to us is how this thought experiment has somehow mutated into what still appears to be the standard meta structure for human history. Uh, so what we find ourselves doing is kind of um, uh, sort of fighting on two fronts. On the one hand, trying to reinterpret the facts, the evidence uh, of archaeology uh, and history to try and put together uh, some of the, the pieces of a new sort of story, uh, but also simultaneously having to go right back to the philosophical roots of the existing story. Uh, so that we're not constantly just sort of pushed back and buffeted back into what seems to be an incredibly powerful myth. Mm. And it is a myth. And, you know, one can show it's a myth in, in fairly concrete ways. I mean, do, do we have any more time or should we be you winding can, uh, up? Well, let me, let me just... Okay. okay. Well, we wanted to have a little question and answer. But, but how about this? Um, shall I talk about how we end up with Condor Rock to begin with? Or, or? Sure. We should do that and end with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. The, to show the power of this myth, if you look at the history of the background to um, Kondiarank and other people engaging in this critique, which was taken so seriously and seems to have had such an enormous impact on on European and hence world thought. Um, you see that people are still trapped in these sort of Turgot-style categories. Of, you know that people there's stages of evolution based on what you do for for your material subsistence, um, and that you know even though maybe it's not strictly linear, people can go back and forth. There's assumption there's a ladder that people and you placing people along that ladder is what's really significant about them. Um, the fascinating thing is you know because people apply that. There's this really obvious thing that's happening 
uh, that nobody seems to notice. First of all, if you look at the history of the eastern woodlands of North America, it just looks nothing like what it's supposed to, uh, according to these models. You start with, uh, say, Hopewell civilization, where you have people living in isolated um, homesteads, getting together in these kind of strange geometric micro cities that are only inhabited a few months a year. Um, Engaging in these elaborate astronomical rituals, and then so so it seems something like a, a, a bit, it's not even a band system; they're just like an in individual households. But then they get together for these cities, um, and then suddenly it turns into a state. You get Cahokia, which is this big city uh, located in what's now East St. Louis, um, and um, tens of thousands of people. Lab uh, seems to be some kind of caste hierarchy, extensive human sacrifice. It could be an empire or maybe a trade empire. No, there's arguments about what was going on, but it's very centralized and, and hierarchical. Then something happens, the whole thing collapses. The area around it turns into, it's almost like the forbidden zone on Planet of the Apes or something. Nobody lives there or anywhere nearby for like, you know, hundreds of years after the collapse. So whatever happened there, people really didn't, let, you know, stayed away afterwards. Um, Okay, then there's a series of successor kingdoms. Uh, those collapse. And then you get these kind of polis-sized republics. Uh, you know. so, so, so by the evolutionary thing, you have some, something not even bands going to a state, to chiefdoms, to tribes. You're going backwards, basically. Um, but these, these republics, you know, uh, often... Um, are very self-consciously creating new constitutions and um, political and social structures for the, uh, some of us even record the Osage, where the guys who seem to be most directly related to whoever it was had lived in Cahokia. Um, you know, if you look at their ethnography, we're lucky enough to have a guy who actually spoke the language well because he was himself uh, half indigenous, uh, who did the ethnography. They talk about how you know these complicated 12s Sky clans and seven Earth clans, and you know we have a moiety system. All that kind of Levi Strauss diagrammatic village stuff. We always wonder, like, you know, who made that up? I mean, how did they come up with that? Was there some point where people just sat with a stick and tried to figure it out? And uh, yes, there was. See, then they actually have a record of when that happened. And how people sort of got together and figured out their constitution. And and interestingly enough, a bunch of Assangers also visited Paris and met Montesquieu, um, and seemed to have had an influence on his whole idea that constitutional orders create the strife of societies. So so again, the Enlightenment ideas kind of came out of these guys more than anything else. But but. Um, so these societies often put a great emphasis on, on a kind of skeptical rationalism, uh, especially the Iroquoian ones, actually. But they also often had very explicit myths saying things like, well, there used to, the Cherokee have uh, this, uh, you know, there used to be hereditary chief uh, priesthood, but they pushed people around, did terrible things. So one day we killed them all, and now we don't have hereditary pri priests anymore. Um, and again, this has just been wiped out of the narrative. Uh, so instead, settlers show up and they find these like highly egalitarian, you know, rationalist and, uh, people against um, inherited authority. Um, a lot of them are basically kind of hippies, um, and and it never occurs to them there's a history here. They just think they have this. They must just be like that primordially. And to this day, people write about this. So it never seems to occur to them that the fact that these guys essentially overthrew a series of, of hierarchical uh, societies um, might have something to do with their opinions uh, on the subject of hierarchy, right? Um, it, the history is wiped out. But clearly, you know, Kandirang is, is, if anything, giving these people the ideology of the movements that overthrew Cahokia and its successor states. And, you know, it doesn't seem to occur to anybody that, that um, this is self-conscious political thought which comes out of a long history of political struggle and that it was so powerful that it affected Europe as well. And this is roughly what we refer to as the myth of the stupid savage, because on the one hand, you, you know, there is actually quite a big literature on how uh, European societies in the age of reason 
adopted various facets of material culture and cuisine from the new world, the whole idea of smoking tobacco in pipes, sitting around in salons, drinking chocolate, uh, but nobody ever quite seems to bother asking highly whether they... Beverages. Highly cap beverages. Highly cap, yeah, <laughs> basically what we've been doing today um, in preparation for this lecture. Uh, but nobody ever seems to bother asking whether they also listened to what the people who were smoking the pipes were actually talking about, which turns out largely to be about constitutional law and various other things that found their way into European thought. Uh, there is, of course, the whole debate about the influence of the Iroquois on the US Constitution. Yeah. This is all later. We're talking about core Enlightenment thought within European salons and coffee houses itself. Right. Um, and I was assuming that when they started looking into this that you'd have to tease out hints because they wouldn't admit that this is where they were getting it from. They would pretend they were getting it from mm -hmm. classical sources, but I was amazed to discover no, they were just totally explicit. You know, yes. That they, no, we got this from Native Americans and then just nobody believes them. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's roughly it. Um, and uh, that, that's roughly it. I mean, we could sort of finish the uh, our dialogue there and okay. sort of have a wider dialogue, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but, yeah. Okay.